welcome everyone to week nine. Hope you were able to enjoy some of the beautiful weather we had over the weekend. Uh, this marks our, our final stop on our journey to Antarctica, uh, this time in a colony of Gentoo penguins. Um, I think there's a, a type of Linux called Gentoo because the like penguin is a is a Linux logo. Assume that's why uh, Gentoo had like many penguins have enormous colonies. This is uh, I think about a tenth of the colony that was on this uh, island that we can can see here. And there's some uh, seabirds that that come around for uh, bits of fish or other scraps they can they can uh, scavenge and. Uh, Penguins have a bit of a, a bit of a hike to get to the water in order to get food uh, from at least parts of this of this colony. Uh, and can be an argumentative uh, bunch. Uh, uh, read that they uh, nest uh, just far enough away so that they can guard each other's eggs, but can't like poke each other. Um, keep keep the peace that way. Um, uh, though they'll, they'll also court, and, and that's that's how you get nests in, in the first place. Uh, here's, a, here's a picture of, of one such nest, uh, and something that, that's pretty cool about the penguins, they can't fly, but they're very powerful swimmers, so they can uh, catch a fair amount of air coming out of the water. All right, what questions do you have about uh, the Malik Lab, System I.O., uh, anything we've been working on? Eric. Do penguins have like natural predators? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, know. Yeah, it would be like killer whales. Like it's not it's not gonna be other birds. It's gonna be stuff in the water that would eat penguins. Um, yeah, orcas or, or um, leopard seals, things like that. I assume that means no no systems related questions. Uh, <laughs> Couple things to be aware of: the uh, our last quiz, we hit quiz is out due uh, tomorrow night. Um, the our final lab, uh, I probably won't have that posted until until tomorrow. I'll probably push the the due date one day later. Um, and uh, the subject of that lab will be uh, implementing a, a networking application. So that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, to get us started, a bit of a bit of history. Uh, the internet began as a uh, U.S. military-funded research project from the Advanced Research Projects Agency (ARPA), um, which is now the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, uh, and that's why it was called ARPANET when it was created in 1969, with all of four connections to the internet. Um, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, University of Utah, uh, and private company SRI. A year later, in 1970, the internet had uh, like quadrupled in size or, or quintupled, something like that. Uh, it's still mostly universities that have, with uh, occasional corporations, RAND uh, or SRI, um, MITRE, that are, that are connected. Uh, and of course, the internet turned out to be a pretty useful thing. So by 1977, a lot bigger, but you could still fit it in a single legible picture. Uh, this diagram actually noting the, the, the machines that were connected, like the PDP-10 computer, um, the, uh, one of the, the ancient devices in the, the hallway in Oland, where the CS department is, is a PDP-8, I think, so uh, from, from this era of, of computing. And these days, uh, we have uh, well over 1 billion connected hosts. Like, this is just uh, places that you can, like, get data from. That's not counting all the devices that are connected to the internet. So it's, uh, it's quite, quite large. Uh, and the basic idea behind all of this networking is a client-server transaction. That is that uh, we have some
client process, and it sends a request across the network to a server process. Now, each of these pro these are each processes running on some uh, on some host or host machines. That these two processes could be on the same uh, computer. They could be on separate computers. Um, it's the, in fact, the same interface uh, that we'll talk about, the socket interface uh, that they'll be using to, to send data back and forth. So client process sends a request, and this request is uh, most likely related to some resource. So uh, step two. Our server is going to handle the request, likely by retrieving whatever resource, image, web page, uh, whatever it is from, uh, uh, could be a, the disk on the machine where the service process is running. Uh, server process could itself be a client that's kind of sending this request on to some other place, but it's handling the request. It then. sends a response back to the client across whatever uh, uh, socket, whatever interface uh, the two are using to communicate, and for the client handles the response. So an example of this would be the client is Google Chrome running on my laptop. I type in carlton.edu into uh, the browser that sends a request to uh, the computer that uh, is providing carlton.edu. It handles that request by retrieving the data associated with that web page, sends that data back to my web browser, which then handles displaying to me. And so, uh, the data sent back and forth here is sent in units called packets. And a packet is going to be Some payload, like the, the HTML, images, JavaScript, whatever is needed to display a web page. Uh, plus some metadata that's going to tell uh, the network where to send the packet. So, we have these fixed size units of, of data. They're often pretty small, so a web page might consist of many uh, such packets uh, to communicate. And each of them has some information attached being like, this is where this packet is supposed to go. And the different parts of uh, the network understand how to use this information to route it uh, uh, where it needs to go. And it may have some kind of circuitous path on its way to and from the client and, and the server. Uh, questions on, on this diagram? Any, any part of this? Christian? I don't know if this question is jumping the gun, but how does either the client or the server know that they've received a request? Or how does one know that the other has received their request? So there are kind of different levels at which we could ask this question. Um, there is this kind of logical level of the client sends the request, how does the server uh, know when that arrives? So uh, 
the basic idea is the server has, has made a system call to tell the kernel, I am waiting for requests. Uh, and then when that requests arrive, uh, the kernels, the, the part of the system that's dealing with the hardware, and it will uh, uh, raise an exception like, hey, your, <coughs> the thing you're waiting for has, has arrived, and then turn control over to the server. Um, so that's kind of the logically how these different parts like get notified by the system that some information has come in over the network. There is a separate question of this information we're sending back and forth is made up of maybe a whole bunch of packets. How do we uh, uh, know that we've gotten all the ones we're waiting for? How do we know when someone has received the one that we sent so we can send the next one? All of that stuff. Uh, and uh, that part of how, uh, like what, is, what governs the sending of these packets back and forth, uh, that is uh, the subject of the protocol. Uh, there's some just kind of set of steps, set of conventions uh, that we're going to, to use to, um, to govern kind of how, how these packets are sent back and forth. Um, and so to that, point, let's talk about the global IP internet. All right. Oh, no. sounds like that's a very nice leading question. Then. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, that's not what I want. I want this. Oh, maybe it'll figure it out. So as just a little introduction, here's an animation of uh, devices uh, connected uh, to the internet. You can see this shadow passing across. Bluer means uh, less activity, redder means more activity. And so you can see how the activity in different parts of the globe kind of rises and falls with uh, the day, day or night cycle. And uh, just a, as a little look into how data actually gets around, um, there, here's a map of all the underwater cables, the submarine cables uh, that carry data uh, uh, long distances underwater. You can see that there's a whole bunch across the Atlantic Ocean and across the Pacific, um, but also a lot of kind of connections uh, around the coast. And so we have this huge uh, kind of infrastructure that, that we've built up to carry data uh, around the world. Um, and I was... <coughs> I have read at various times about the potential for unusual solar activity to just fry these cables and like cut off large parts of the internet, um, which is is a bit a bit terrifying. Um, so uh, this kind of protocol we can break down into uh, uh, different pieces. So I guess the first thing I would say. Uh, we have capital I, the internet, which is kind of what I've just been showing you pictures of. Uh, we also have kind of lowercase i internet. There's a, a set of interconnected networks. So this kind of map of the submarine cables sort of gives you the idea that there's uh, maybe kind of networks uh, and various points on land, and then they're interconnected through these submarine cables, forming the capital I internet. I said that how this data is sent, sent around is governed by, by protocol. We have IP. standing for Internet Protocol. And uh, this is what gives us our naming scheme for kind of how to refer to things on the internet. Um, and cool. 
and does define a way of delivering the, the, the packets, but it's not, not reliable. It doesn't guarantee that packets uh, arrive in the order that they were sent, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't let the, uh, the sender know when, when they've been received, so there's uh, definitely some, some downsides to that. And uh, what kind of modern networks tend to be based on is TCP, the the transmission control protocol, uh, and this uses this internet protocol. process streams of bytes. So there's a whole lot of complexity in how TCP uh, achieves it, this, which is kind of beyond uh, our scope. Uh, one uh, interesting uh, thing that TCP does is it tries to find the appropriate rate at which to send packets. And it does this by um, continually ramping up how fast it's sending them until uh, they start being dropped and not succeeding, and then it sort of backs off. Uh, and it ramps up linearly and backs off exponentially. And so you might hear exponential back off as a, a phrase associated with TCP as it sort of tries to find the appropriate load um, uh, for, for the, the whatever network it's sending information across. Questions on that? Great. Um, when you're talking about like, how it like, acknowledges that it's found um, the request, you know, like TCP like, has the handshakes of SIM in the back. Is that the only way to do it? Or is there other ways to so that, that, that's, that's a good point. And how do we know that when a packet has been received, TCP involves sending an acknowledgment back anytime we receive a packet? Um, so I don't think. Uh, I guess I would say there's uh, there is not a commonly used alternative to TCP. Um, I think that it is an active area of networks research. Of are there other protocols that would be more efficient in certain circumstances? So just if we have a particularly unreliable network, is the TCP protocol appropriate, or if we have an extremely reliable one, can we be more aggressive than TCP is? Uh, but off the top of my head, I don't know of another technique in this sort of acknowledgement, but uh, like to answer that, I would, I would search the kind of computer networking literature. John? If, how does, so if, the, if like the client sends uh, something to the server, and the server sends back uh, like a handshake that says that it's received it. How does the server know that like the client has received that handshake, or do they just accept that it's probably received that handshake? Um, I don't think that there's kind of this this infinite series of I received the handshake that you received that I received that you received. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you send an acknowledgement and the sign that it was received is, is that you get the next packet from, from the client. Um, as the, that the TCP is kind of uh, handing that sort of order, order of arrival. Other questions? All right, so let's look at uh, kind of one, uh, one quick overview of uh, the sort of uh, computer organization side of, of uh, how this is being handled. So we have client and our server and both of these are at the level of user code. That kind of they're just they're user applications 
as opposed to say the operating system kernel or, or the hardware. And then kind of as the current as the client uh, wants to send data using TCP uh, on IP. Um, this is done with the sockets interface, which are system calls that are that the operating system provides to ask it to send information over, over the network, and that it would be kernel code that is actually handling the uh, uh, kind of assembling the, the, the packets and, and sending them to uh, uh, to the, the network adapter component uh, on the computer system. And we kind of one step down from this, we have actual hardware interface uh, the network adapter being the component of the computer system that actually handles uh, uh, sending and receiving data across across the network uh, and then these would uh, communicate using our Global IP internet, the submarine cables, or uh, the Wi-Fi on, on campus, kind of whatever uh, internet access it has. So the client makes uh, a system call to say, send this data. The kernel assembles that data, passes it on to the network adapter, which then sends it on to uh, the the internet, it gets routed to the network adapter of whatever uh, machine the server is on, which uses a, uh, an interrupt to let the kernel know that uh, the data has arrived. The kernel kind of decodes or unpacks the, the TCIP data and hands that back to the, the server, which has told the kernel that it's waiting for some connection via, via a system call. Questions on that? Okay. This is sort of unrelated, but for some reason this like sparked this question about um, if the submarine cables were to fry, would that would the issue be ice like would certain areas still have parts of the internet? Like it seems like it's conversation between computers mm -hmm. where it does get cut. How exactly is that sort of I mean, I don't know. Um, yes, it means that uh, for example, a um, company like Google, lots and lots of data, uh, they don't want to use uh, lose any, uh, and so data tends to be, and they want it to be fast to access no matter where you are, and so that data tends to be replicated in many places or several places across the globe. Um, and uh, there are also, so, that functionality would suffer if you couldn't have these places far apart communicate. It's also the case that a website, say a French government website, you might just be unable to access it because the only way for that data to get from the computer where it is to you is across an underwater cable that is no longer functioning. I can restate again the difference between the uppercase internet and the lowercase internet. So a lowercase internet is a general term for any set of interconnected networks. Uh, so the, uh, the textbook has kind of more details that we don't have time to get into about the actual like physical infrastructure of what makes a network. Uh, but you can think of like Carlton's campus is a network. And Carlton's campus has connections to things outside the campus, uh, thus forming and uh, an internet or internet. Um, 
instead of other connected networks. And then there is a particularly large and well-known set of internet interconnected networks that we call the internet, which is what I'm, I'm saying is the capital I internet. Oh. So going back to the submarine cable, there was like multiple going across that. Like, so if one of them, it's got like can we just assume like everything in North America is probably connected not through submarine cables, and everything in Europe is also connected not through submarine cables, so you can still access everything. Uh, well, we were specifically thinking of communication between North America and Europe. So there's data that's only in Europe. Yeah, but like if one cable burns up or whatever, it oh, yeah. a different one. Well, yeah, so th this particular scenario was uh, solar activity affects the whole globe, fries all the cables. Okay. But yes, if one of them, one of them gets damaged, uh, the um, the bandwidth, the rate of data we can transfer between is slowed somewhat because we just have like fewer wires to send it across. But yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't cut off. Yeah, there is some duplication. Chris, what actually pays for all this infrastructure? Um, this is something that's sort of miraculous about the internet is that it's since its inception, it's been a sort of decentralized ad hoc. I think there's like a non-profit, uh, I think it's called I-C-A-N-N, -N. I don't remember what that stands for. ICANN is this kind of non-profit organization that sort of sets the rules. But for example, uh, uh, there was, up until 1988, there was just a, 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 a text file somewhere that had all the information about how, like, what websites went with what computers. Uh, uh, and so the infrastructure is paid for by internet service providers, by governments, by utility companies, um, and it's kind of a labyrinthine ad hoc system where like there's all these different pieces that are all sort of connected up and there's no kind of overall managing body. It's just sort of, um, you think of it as, as people kind of built roads wherever they felt a road would be useful and uh, it's either a government that did it with tax dollars or a private corporation that then charges money for people to use the road um, and when we needed more roads sometimes people invested in and built them and sometimes we really like for there to be more roads and but no one's currently building more of them okay Michael. I don't really need to distract this further, but how much faster would the internet be if we just did, made another cable? Like, uh, that's the US like, like, somewhere. Um, <laughs> I mean, not, not noticeably <laughs> to any like, individual. Uh, and I think the, you, hear, you hear a lot of discussion of um, rural broadband, as in like the uh, access to the internet is very uneven geographically, where like uh, um, someplace like Northfield, a lot of network infrastructure, partially from the two colleges that are here, uh, other otherwise similar small towns in Minnesota might not, like no one has built the like highway uh, uh, to, to that place internet wise and so uh, I think that a more high level infrastructure would have like a very more like uh, not perceptible to an individual effect but like partic particular places would definitely see a, a huge difference from, from more infrastructure alright let's keep going um, so you may have seen this term IP uh, in the past in reference to an IP address. And that's what uh, I mean by this naming scheme. We have this way, just like uh, when we want to mail something, there's an address that tells whoever is delivering the mail where to take it. We have the same sort of thing uh, for the internet. So our IP address is just uh, 
a 32-bit number uh, that identifies some computer connected to the internet. So, uh, right? and these by convention are, uh, we might have something like our 32-bit number hex 802c2f2. Uh, so, uh, one, two, three, four bytes, 32 bits. Uh, but by convention, we don't usually see IP addresses written this way. Uh, we see each, each byte written out as its decimal equivalent. So we would see uh, hex 80, 128, uh, and then it's this dotted decimal notation where right, each byte has its decimal value separated by dots, so 80, dot two, uh, the third byte, 194, and finally, F2, 242. And so IP addresses get written this way as a kind of more uh, human, human readable, uh, if you were formed than, than the, the raw hex number. And uh, each of our IP addresses maps to a domain name, just like some text uh, that identify that, that is a name for for wherever this, this IP address. Um, uh, maps to, I guess, I shouldn't say each. IP addresses commonly map to, to domain names. Um, for example, uh, there's the domain name www.carlton.edu, and this is equivalent to 35.228. Dot two twenty seven dot one eighty nine and yeah, Chris. Um, so, like a virtual computer would have a domain name, right? Uh, so yeah. So if let's see if this can read my it can amazing. Uh, so if I bring up the networking on this laptop. See that it has, uh, it's probably too small to see, but it's giving me, uh, it's, it's impossible to see. Uh, it, this gives me, uh, this tells me that my IP address is 10.133.18.84, and this is one that was just assigned to this laptop when it connected uh, to the Wi-Fi. And uh, I think it is also assigned a domain, uh, a domain name, uh, awb68130.local. So it's a sort of automatically generated uh, uh, domain name, not, of course, one that would be visible, like you couldn't put that into a web browser and, and connect to it, but it is, it is assigned this sort of uh, network name, yeah? So this just varies by network. Uh, I think at least on uh, Edurome on campus, this laptop is always assigned that IP, which is very useful because I have to type it in every time I want to display. Uh, so it's nice that it's always assigned the same one. I think it's kind of registered with uh, uh, the whatever ITS However, ITS is managing the network, network infrastructure, so it's always getting assigned the same one. Um, I expect if I was connecting on the Carlton Guest Wi-Fi, it would be getting assigned a different one each time. Oh. I think there's no upper within a network, right? So, like, a domain kind of like an IP address within like one network and a different one from another, or like, like the host that you would probably need like within a capital I Internet network to have that IP address. But 
Yeah, so this, this is getting a, a bit more into the, into the, the weeds than, um, than, we'll, than we'll go, but you can have a network that is uh, that uh, a bunch of computers on that network share one connection to the wider internet. So for example, like my IP address on this computer, the 10.133.18.84, some computer outside of Carlton couldn't just connect to that because that's a, an IP address that's only within the Carlton network that was assigned to this computer by the Carlton network. Uh, and then Carlton has uh, a much smaller set of connections that are sort of visible or accessible by the wider, wider internet. So yeah, there can be this sort of um, networks within, within networks. Uh, one one uh, kind of important structure is kind of how these domain names work. And there's uh, a hierarchy sort of the way that we're used to thinking of uh, uh, websites kind of from the end on forward is kind of uh, there's everything within .edu and then within that domain there's carlton.edu and then within that uh, we have, for example, uh, mathcs.carlton.edu, and then we've used both mantis.mathcs.carlton.edu and mirage.mathcs.carlton.edu, and these two computers, they're just computers in a closet somewhere on campus, have distinct IP addresses. Um, there's also campushub.carlton.edu, or www.amazon.com has, yeah, it's, its own IP. Um, uh, and so typically kind of within some organization, uh, the organization will have some, uh, some higher level domain like carlson.edu and then kind of within that uh, maybe a number of different servers. John? <clears throat> Is there like a logical way in which IP addresses are given like the number of kind of individual names or just like a random uh, so it's not random, uh, like an organization, it, it, we're talking about IP addresses that are on the kind of global internet. An organization like Carlton might own, I mean this is just for example, I don't, uh, like Carlton might have everything 137.22. Anything. anything. that's all kind of owned by Carleton College, and then they can do with this range of um, uh, 256 squared uh, different addresses, they can do whatever they want. And in fact, Carleton's actually in the process of selling off um, some large chunk of IP addresses that the college uh, has owned for a long time that it's decided it doesn't need, which turns out uh, are uh, fairly valuable. A lot of people want Want uh, connections to the internet, Caden? Um, will IP addresses ever run out? Uh, IP addresses have run out. Um, this 32-bit addresses are what's called IP version four or IPv4. Um, a number of years ago, uh, there's a figure in the notes. Um, uh, a number of years ago, uh, folks introduced IPv6. Uh, with 128-bit addresses, so many, many more addresses, there'd be enough. Uh, but adoption has been slow. Um, there's still only like 35% uh, of internet traffic using IPv6. Um, but that has been increasing because we, we all the IPv4 addresses are, are used. You don't have, I mean, Carlton owns a bunch that they're selling because they don't need them, but um, in, in some sense, we're sort of out of IPv4. Um, but IPv6 having um, orders of magnitude more, uh, we're not going to run out of those. Kristen? Do you have any idea how much single address costs? Um, I don't. I think that this like big chunk of IP addresses is like something like a million dollars, maybe a hundred thousand. I actually. I was told once how much it was, but it's like a substantial amount of money. I, but I do forget the exact order of magnitude. Other questions? Eric? Could that be like uh, some sort of 
Uh, I think investing in IPv4, given the use of IPv6 is going up, maybe not a great long-term investment. Like I might expect that to. I mean, people have invested in these domain names. Like you can own a domain name and then like map it to whatever IP you want. So I know that that people had in. Um, uh, uh, like you might buy um, uh, electric.com, I don't know, pick a random example. That's not currently being used. You don't have anything you want to do with it, but you're like, you know, someone's going to want electric.com sometime. So I'll buy it now and then, and then sell it to the highest bidder some, some later time. Um, but no, I, I, I wouldn't recommend investing in IP addresses. Michael. Um, yeah, why would you want to buy an IP people? Why is there a market for it? Since IPv6 um, a lot of uh, network infrastructure is still using IPv4, so uh, a lot of like if you want it to be accessible to the 65% uh, of traffic using IPv4, you need to have one of those IP addresses. Sam, um, are we going to talk about the process of or like how um, domain names are mapped to IP addresses? Uh, that's not something we're going to have time for. It's called uh, DNS, Domain Name Service, uh, and the textbook does, does talk about that. Uh, but yeah, we, we won't unfortunately have time for that. John? So presumably if you're like purchasing an IP address from like a website or, or a domain name rather from a website or something, like you have to pay them money to mm -hmm. the thing because they own it, but like, like if, if no one has registered a domain name, like who do they who gets well, for an entity? What you're actually paying them for is this mapping step. You're paying uh, a service that whenever someone puts in a website, it goes to talk to one of these places to be like, what IP address goes with this website? So you are purchasing a domain name so then you can tell them what IP address to direct it to. So that when someone enters that URL, they get sent to your server. Could you like, do that yourself? Uh, you would need to get the global internet structure to start sending these requests to you. Um, I think it would be challenging. Um, I'm sure part of it was sort of first mover, like the internet's been like slowly accreting for decades, and so. It's just worked out that there's some services that are, are doing this, and then kind of people, once it became commercial, people started creating businesses around this. Um, I don't know in detail kind of what the history of, of the Dominion service folks is. Uh, all right, there's, there's stuff I need to talk about for, for the lab, so let's keep going. Um, all right, so I started by drawing this picture of client-server connection, and now we have these IP addresses that identify some actual spot on the network. So uh, how are we actually using those? So this is where this idea of a, a socket comes in. So A socket is the endpoint of a connection, and it consists of I'll draw this with a colon, an IP address and a port this pair of, of numbers. An IP address we've talked about, 32-bit number, at least for IPv4, and uh, a port is a 16-bit number, uh, and this port can either be A 
ephemeral, like uh, a process makes a request and the kernel just assigns it a temporary port to use. Uh, it could also be There are certain ports associated with uh, well-known services, for example, HTTP, uh, the uh, service uh, that we use to, to get websites, then uses port 80. And so just there will be a number of ports that are associated with particular services. Like a, an SSH connection uses port 22 uh, would be another example. And so our picture is one where we have our client, and our client has, remember our socket is an endpoint of a connection, so our client has an IP address 128. blah 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 dot two four two on port five one two one three. And it's connected to our server that also has a socket, its endpoint to the connection, which might be the IP address 208 dot blah 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 uh, dot 15, and it's a web server, and so it's point 80. So our, our client said, give me a connection to uh, this uh, the, the client created a, a, a socket with kind of its endpoint, and it has the client has IP address 128, uh, so on, and the kernel assigned it this temporary port of 51,213. Server was awaiting HTTP connections, so it's kind of listening on, on port 80. Client uh, makes kind of before it makes a request it kind of establishes this connection between these two sockets, which kind of is a reliable um, two-way connection between our server and our client. So that's Wait, so is the server listening on 80, or does the client specifically request for 80? Both. The, the server, in order for the client to successfully make a connection with the server, the server has to be listening for connections on that particular port, or on a range of ports that include Uh, sorry, say that again. Oh, there is a colon in between the IP address and the port. Yeah, but like the port itself, 16 bits, right? Yeah. And how do, is it like we just convert 16 bits to that port, or do we do the thing where we convert it in bytes? Oh, so, so typically you'll see just this 16-bit number written as a decimal number. Uh, yeah, so it, it's just, it's in the range of, of 0 to, to the 16th minus 1. Other questions? All right, so this, uh, this sockets interface was created in the... Uh, in the 1980s as part of the original distribution of the Unix operating system. Um, and it's now available in all modern systems. So uh, all kinds of Unix, Windows, uh, Mac OS, iOS, Android, these all use sockets. And so, as I said, it's an endpoint of a connection. That's sort of from the kernel's perspective. Uh, from the application's perspective, we have our socket is system I.O., where from the application's perspective, 
This socket is a file descriptor, just an integer that, core, that, that the application can use to read and write uh, uh, from, from the network. So, so last time that an application can use file descriptor one to print out to the terminal, file descriptor zero to read from the terminal, and our socket's going to be a file descriptor that, let, that lets us read and write from the network, from this connection between server and client. So we might label that this socket is our client FD, our client file descriptor, and our server is our server file descriptor. So they, the, both of these processes use that descriptor to, to interact with the network. And the main distinction between our, like, a file descriptor for a regular file and a file descriptor for our socket is we use different system calls to kind of open a file versus open a socket. But kind of in terms of uh, reading and, and writing, once we have that file descriptor, that will work the same in both cases. All right, so let's look at some actual code. So uh, I want to build up a server that is going to uh, do something very simple, just like uh, I'm, I want to be able to send text to the server and have it send it back, and uh, basically a, a server that doesn't echo, just sends back whatever I sent it. Uh, so, I'm going to start with uh, writing the echo client, and I'll include uh, the header from the, the textbook, uh, and have my main with the uh, uh, arguments that uh, C programs use to take command line input, where you get the number of command line arguments and then an array of strings, one for each command line argument. And uh, I'm going to say that, okay, the host that I'm trying to connect to is going to be uh, the kind of Second argument, because the first argument is always the name of the command uh, that was, was run in order to start this program. Uh, and then I'll expect the port uh, after that. So if I was wanting to write something robust, I would probably check, did I get the right number of arguments and print out some useful message? If I didn't, but we'll skip that for now. And the other, so I, the first thing I'm going to want to do is to open a kind of client socket. And there are a number of system calls, uh, there's uh, a couple of system calls involved uh, in this that I'm gonna gloss over. Uh, and there's this open client FD uh, function that we'll use that's sort of a wrapper for these. Uh, the notes in the textbook have the kind of nitty gritty details if you're curious. We're just gonna open one of these uh, and we'll give it the host and the port. And this is going to be an integer, because it's just a file descriptor. Uh, and what I'm going to want to do is to uh, repeatedly read input from user, send to the server, read server's uh, response, and print it. This is kind of the what the client's going to do in this echo uh, uh, to make this echo work. So um, these I need to give them types as well. So for this, I am going to set up a temporary buffer that's going to be uh, a max line length, which is defined in this, in this header to be uh, 8,192 characters. And then I will say while f gets uh, read into the buffer, this up to max line of characters from standard in, um, and while this does not equal null, I am kind of going to keep reading lines from the user 
uh, until uh, until they uh, enter a kind of an end of file, uh, which is you, you on, on in a terminal is Control D to kind of send an, an end of file, or otherwise end the program. And as you, does anyone remember from the system I uh, when we talked about system I/O which uh, functions do we want to use to read and write over the network? Yeah, we want to use those robust I/O functions. Um, we'll, we'll make our life easier on the network. And so I'm also going to need uh, one of these uh, Rio structs to facilitate the kind of buffered uh, reading. And I, before I can use it, I need to initialize it. And I give it a pointer to the struct I'm initializing, and I give it the file descriptor that it's going to be doing the buffered reading from. And so I have read a line from the user, and now I want to just write that uh, buffer using my socket. It's just a file descriptor. I'm just going to write to that, that socket. I'm going to give it uh, uh, the buffer to read from and say uh, the number of bytes to write to the socket is however long the string the user entered is. Which, because I read up to max line characters, will be at most, at most that long. So that's the repeatedly reads from user input send to server. And now I want to read the server's response. So I'm just going to read one line of response from uh, the server using the, uh, I say, use the this Rio uh, struct. That's what we're reading from, which I set up to read from my, my socket. Read it into my buffer up to max line number of characters, and then F puts, just print the buffer to standard out. Questions so far? Silas? If you're writing it in the buffer and then reading it, doesn't that like, not take advantage of the fact that your buffer can, like, doesn't that not take advantage of the point of the buffer? Um, so this buffer is the, uh, it's kind of a, a temporary kind of uh, place where data that I read from the user lives uh, and data that I read from the, the server lives. Uh, this read line B will, um, uh, will do a buffered read from the, uh, from the server, which means if the server is sending a lot of data, this read line B internally will be doing a buffered read in order to fill up the sort of destination buffer. Other questions? Eric. So initializing this Rio T struct, that's only for reading, that's not for writing? That's right. We're, uh, we, we, Rio does buffered reads, but only has this kind of write. Um, I think I mistyped it. Um, Yes, it should be right and it's the actual name of the function. But yeah, it's, it does not do, do buffered writes. Um, then once I am done, I'm going to want to make sure to close my socket. Uh, so this is the, the client side. Um, there's some, some boilerplate that I'm going to not talk about in the interest of time on the client side. Um, so I'll copy that in here. Oops. Will this let me select? All right, so this will be, save this as uh, echo server I dot C. And uh, the basic idea is that we are using this open listen FD to open up our kind of listening socket uh, on the server. And then we're just going to loop forever, waiting for connections from clients. Uh, and the important thing here is this accept function. This is one of the sockets system calls 
that just says, using this file descriptor, pause the program here and just wait for someone to make a connection. And this accept function only returns once a connection is made. So the server just waits uh, at this line until a connection is made. Once that connection is made, it returns the file descriptor of that particular socket that is communicating with the client. And once I have that, I use this git name info library function just to go from this kind of uh, socket address storage uh, struct to a string host name and port so I can print out uh, this, uh, this message of telling the server will print out who connected to it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the details of this kind of socket address data structure is sort of messy. Um, uh, if the, you know, the, the textbook has those, those details if you're curious. Uh, and then all I'm going to do is call this echo function uh, once I have that connection. And the echo function has a similar structure to my client where uh, it's going to initialize uh, a Rio buffer on the uh, socket file descriptor. It will read uh, uh, and then just while it reads lines um, uh, from this connection, it will print out a message that it receives some number of bytes and then just write them back. Just read a line, write it back. And that's all this, this echo function does. So with these uh, uh, things in here, I can then go to Mantis, go to 208 here, and split vertically. Make this bigger, get this one over there. All right, so then I can compile uh, GCC dash O uh, echo client, go client C, and this. Oh my, oh yes. This needs the Ethread library. Um, fascinating. I have given that some kind of bad. Oh, I made it an array of character pointers. It is an array of characters. That would explain that. All right, we have the client, and then we'll compile uh, echo server i echo.c, and I still need to give it this. Looks like I did not do an include. All right, compile that. I can start my server. I need to give it a, a port name, say one, two, three, four. And it's waiting there, echo uh, client. Uh, I will connect to the uh, uh, local uh, local machine for, for uh, local host on port, port 1234. And it shows, OK, it's connected to this. And it was assigned a temporary port by the kernel, uh, 3412. Uh, are you there, server? And so sort of received those 22 bytes and sent them back to the client. So kind of we have built up something that can 
uh, open up a Saga connection, uh, read those bytes, and write them back using these um, these Rio uh, Rio functions. So, uh, what are your questions on this, Christian? I just want to comment that I was a little confused at first when the server didn't respond. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, it's not a smart server. It just just replies with whatever whatever it got. Um, all right. So I think what I would like to do with our uh, remaining bit of time is to start talking about uh, uh, web servers and then finish that up on on Wednesday. Uh, this. You will be implementing uh, something not dissimilar from this echo server um, in, in the lab. So uh, the, uh, the like a, so a web server is um, here we go. So as I mentioned before, uh, our uh, kind of port 80 used for HTTP. Our kind of web servers um, is this HTTP is another protocol that kind of defines how uh, clients and, and servers can communicate. This is the hypertext hypertext transfer protocol. That's what, that's what HTTP stands for. And it's essentially the same picture uh, as, uh, as uh, we started with, where our client is going to send an HTTP request to a server, the server processes it, sends an HTTP response back, uh, and then the client processes that. And this protocol just defines kind of uh, what those uh, 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 requests and responses look like. So just to give a bit of an example before we dive into the details uh, next time. If I go to uh, my browser and new tab and go to carlton.edu slash index.html, brings up this site. I can uh, go to, in Chrome, uh, look at developer tools and bring up this, this box here. And if I go to this network tab and then refresh the page, it's gonna show me all the different HTTP requests uh, that the browser uh, uh, made um, as part of loading this page. I can click on the first one and this request consists of a header, which is kind of has the the information about okay the the URL uh, index.html. There is a method. There are different kinds of requests that you can make. This one is a get. Uh, here is the IP address uh, and port that it's that is sending, and then the server sent back these response headers with information about, okay, the content's going to be encoded, compressed using gzip, it's going to be a, a text HTML, told me the date, stuff about the server, other information that the browser might or might not use, but it's kind of all this information. Out. Here's extra stuff that might help you process this response. And then I can look at the response itself, maybe, uh, and I can see that it's just a bunch of, it's like a bunch of HTML and, and JavaScript that was like, after these headers, I got the kind of content of the response sent back to the browser, and then the browser used that to display this web page. So we'll get more into the details of what these 
request and response headers are and how we how we use them and uh, and how we're going to use them in the lab next time. Uh, but for now, uh, Malik lab due tonight, quiz due Tuesday, on office hours Tuesday night, and I'll see you on Wednesday.